You know, I, I should have, I, I didn't know Doug was going to do that this morning until I got here at the church, and I was just planning on playing it on my cell phone, and I think I should have just done that. But that song, The Lion Sleeps Tonight, was recorded in 1939. So if you were here when that song was released, we honor you. But that song, I have to tell you, I remember my dad had a old 45 record, and he had that song on a 45. The Lion Sleeps Tonight. And the truth of the matter is this, is that goes against nature. Because lions do not sleep at night. In fact, lions do totally opposite of sleeping. That is when they're out and they're praying, they're prowling. They're out trying to fill their stomachs. And so the world today, and even thinking about the lyrics of that song, we have an enemy in the world that wants you to believe that the lion is sleeping. And today my sermon is entitled, like Pastor Duck said, The Lion Never Sleeps. The lion never sleeps. I'm going to read some statistics to you. I actually pulled out of some old notes from 2009. It was a Barna poll then. And anybody that knows about George Barna and his polls, you will realize the way that they do it, they are pretty much dead on the way that they do their polling. In fact, they're known as probably the best polling company out there. And and they deal a lot with Christians, born-again Christians in our faith. But this was a Barna poll from 2009. And let me just read what the title says here. It says, Most American Christians do not believe that Satan or the Holy Spirit exist. 2009. This is shocking to me. It says, According to Barna, 6 out of 10 Christians in the United States believe that Satan is not a real entity. Rather, a symbol of evil, just a symbol highlighted. In addition to that, tens of millions of Americans believe that Jesus Christ sinned while he was on earth. It says even more than that, don't, uh, many don't believe the Holy Spirit is real also. They don't believe it's a living ent- entity. Rather, like Satan, most Christians in America believe the Holy Spirit to simply be a symbol of God's power. Most people, including Christians, are ignorant when it comes to the basic biblical teachings. It's not that American Christians don't have a high view of Scripture, according to Barna. Slightly majority of Christians, 55%, strongly agree that the Bible is accurate in all its principles as it teaches, with another 18% agreeing somewhat about one Out of five, either disagree strongly, 9% are somewhat, 13% with this statement, and 5% are sure what to believe, or they're not sure what to believe. Now, this was in 2009. The statistic, as of last year, 65% of Christians do not believe that Satan is real. Staggering. Staggering. And my goal today is this, is not in any way to lift or glorify Satan. In fact, whenever I mention him in my notes, it's lowercase. Because he's just a dirty dog. And that's the way I see him. But he's much more than that. And that's what we need to look at today. We need to open up Scripture. So I'm going to ask everybody if we'd bow our heads, because I'm going to ask God to speak this message very clearly this morning. It's a message that we all need to hold on to because the thing is, is this, we all have an opponent. We all have an enemy who is out to destroy, kill, and steal, the Bible says, from each and every one of us. So let's bow this morning. Father, I just ask, Lord, that as we open the text today, Lord, your word to us that was inspired by the Holy Spirit, Father, cause us, Lord, to see what Peter has to say to those that were being persecuted, to those that were being run out of their homes, out of their churches, out of their meeting places. But God, cause us, Lord, to see today and use the Holy Spirit to show us 
how this applies to our life today. Because this is scripture that is prescribed to us in the world that we live in today. Lord, I pray this, that we embrace it, that we hear, that we uh, hear what your word has to say about defeating the enemy that comes against us day after day after day. So, Father, I just ask, Lord, just cause us, Lord, to have hearts that receive and ears to hear, but also, Lord, a will that lines up with yours to apply it in our lives. So, Father, we just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Peter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through 9. 7 through 9. Now, many of you know that we've been studying through 1 Peter now. This is, believe I believe it's week 21. We have spent a lot of time through going through, preaching through verse from verse to verse to verse. And again, I believe it's important that that's the way that we preach. Because again, I think a lot of times what can happen is if we don't preach verse to verse to verse to verse, a lot of times we can take Scripture out of context. We can make it and bend it and apply it the way that we want it. And so we're going through what Peter is saying to these people that have been persecuted, that are facing persecution. And it says this in verse 7, Casting all your anxieties on Him, or some of your Bibles will say cares, because He cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And these verses here, these are the verses that I want to look at this morning. But what I want to do is this, is I want to take... Verse 7, and I want to put it at the end of my message this morning. I want you to receive verse 7 at the end of my message because I believe that, again, it's going to be powerful for all of us that are battling and are in a battle every day. So I want to look at verse 8. And before we start looking at verse 8, listen, don't let the statistics of 65% of Christians don't believe Satan is real. Here at Momentum Christian Church, we believe that Satan is real. We believe that he is an opponent, that he is an enemy. But we also believe and teach that he is under our feet as born-again believers. Amen. And the Word of God shows us that, or I wouldn't say it. So again, he is a foe. He is a, the, the Bible describes him many ways. It calls him Satan. It calls him uh, the deceiver. It calls him darkness. It calls him... Be- uh, Beelzebub, it calls him many by many different names. And the thing is with Satan is this, is he's been here throughout time. We see him show up in Genesis chapter 3. And we see his demise in Revelation 20, praise God. I cannot wait for the day that he is cast in to the eternal pit forever. With no plan of escape. I'm looking forward to that day. As a pastor, as somebody that you might say is on the front lines of dealing with people, I've seen the destruction of the devil. And the reason why we believe that the devil is a real enemy here is because we base everything off of the word of God. Jesus himself acknowledges the devil as being an enemy. And so should we. And that's why we believe that the devil is real. It's not symbolic. And I don't know about you, but I know from experience that he's real. I've battled him. He is, he is at times claimed victory for short times in my life. Whether it be words that I speak or actions. How many of you know what I'm talking about? But in verse 8, Peter says this, Be sober-minded. And that word sober there means not to be intoxicated or drunk, but to be marked by being serious, being watchful. And I would encourage you today, listen, I think of the scripture where we're also told, listen, don't be drunk. Don't be filled with new wine 
or don't be filled with wine, the scripture says, but be filled with the Spirit. Recently, for the guys that went to the No Regrets men's conference, there was a teaching there that was so powerful what that verse meant. And here we're being told here, be be sober-minded. Don't be intoxicated. And what happened was this. Stuart Briscoe brought it across, and he used an example of someone that is intoxicated with alcohol. Has anybody here ever seen somebody, or maybe you've been intoxicated with alcohol? You do things that you normally wouldn't do. You're not in control of yourself. I I could tell you stories uh, after stories. When I was young, I worked for a gas station that was across our street, right from our across from our house. In fact, my whole family ended up getting jobs there and worked there at some point uh, at one time in their lives. But but my main job was maintenance when I worked there. And I couldn't tell you Saturday morning when I went to go clean the gas station in the yard, how many $50 bills, $20 bills, and even a $100 bill at one time I found. Because what would happen is when the bars closed down Friday night, they would pull into the gas station to get gasoline, and they would just loosely pull out their money, and money would fall to the ground, and it would be up against the fence in the morning. But I also have had experience with people that have been intoxicated. I can tell you, I I have never been intoxicated. And and again, uh, we preach here at the church, again, uh, that drunkenness is the sin. But I believe the Scripture also points to us and says, listen, we shouldn't play with alcohol. It's not wise. But I will not sit here and preach and say that you having a drink is a sin. I would say... Between you and God, you need to ask Him what He wants in your life. But the thing is, is this, is Stuart Briscoe said this, that a person that's intoxicated, they are not in control of their actions. Or a lot of times they do things that they normally wouldn't do. And he said this, people that are filled with the Spirit, when the Spirit speaks, and again, the Spirit being the one that speaks, us being in control, They do things they normally wouldn't do. How many have ever been prompted to pray for somebody out in the street or in the store by the Holy Spirit? It's not nothing normally you'd want to do. What prompted you to do it? The Holy Spirit. And so we're being told here by Peter, listen, be sober-minded. Don't be intoxicated. Don't be one that's out of control, but be controlled. And he says this, and Mark this and be very serious about this. So he says, be sober-minded, be serious, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And, And as I was studying out this portion of Scripture, what came to my mind was this. How would Peter know anything about lions? See, it's a little different for us. How many have ever been to the Detroit Zoo? I have been to the Detroit Zoo. And at the Detroit Zoo, you know what? If you go on cool days, more than likely you will see the lions. How many of you here have ever been to a circus? I've been to a circus. I have seen lions. How many of you ever watched movies and there was lions in the movie? So... Us being able to see lions in the world that we live in today, you can go on the internet, not right now, type in lion and push in video, and you know what? There's going to be all kinds of videos of lions that you'll be able to watch, you'll be able to see. Peter did not have this opportunity. Where he was located, there was not lions. The only lions that Peter knew of were the ones that they brought into the Colosseum on Nero's game days for the persecution of Christians. And as I studied about this last Monday, I was looking into it in depth because there's some people that say, no, there was nobody ever fed the lions. How many know that that's not true? In fact, even before the New Testament, we see Daniel who gets cast into the lion's den because that was a way to get rid of people. But in the Romans, the Romans were experts 
at what they did in the Colosseums. But as I studied it out, what I found out, and there's no small ears here today, so I can share this with you, but I share it because we need to understand the seriousness of what he's talking about here. But in the Colosseum, a lot of times, if they had just one Christian that was going to be killed, they would release dogs or hogs, I found out, to destroy a Christian. But when they brought out the lions, the reason why they brought out the lions is because at times they did a special day just for the emperor, or he would declare a special day where they would bring in many people into the Colosseum as a group. And this happened often. So Peter more than likely had heard or he had firsthand information or he had seen this to where they brought in a group of people and let the hungry lions go. And, and so I want you to keep that in your mind. This is where he's getting this idea. And, and, and we're going to hit on some points that are going to bring it home to us. But we see in verse 8 there, he says this, your adversary, the devil, and that word adversary there means opponent, slash Satan, the arch enemy. The arch enemy. Out of all the enemies in the world, I can tell you today, the main enemy in your life is Satan. He's the one that wants to destroy you. He's the one that wants to get you to not be effective in your Christian walk. And he's, he's a master at that. He's a master at that, is taking Christians and allowing them not to even be effective. I was looking in Scripture and I thought to myself, what is, what is the main things that Satan attacked? Because we tend to think that maybe it's just us. But I believe that there's actually four things where we see Satan uh, attacks and where he tried to attack and tried to kill. The first source of his attack was Jesus Christ in the gospel. Jesus Christ in the gospel. It says this in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. Satan's idea of Jesus was this. I'm going to destroy him as soon as I can. And how many of you know that there was something put in operation? To kill every male child. And, and how many know that Jesus, through God's sovereignty, escaped that? Through God's hand, he was able to escape that because of the obedience of his parents. So Satan, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is the first thing that Satan is going to go after and attack constantly. The gospel. Think about that. What is the gospel? The good news of Jesus Christ. Satan doesn't want that message to go out. In many ways, he tries to stop it. Again, he has taken and distorted God's word in many ways to make you believe that through the gospel that, again, that you can do whatever you want and God still loves you. You can remain a sinner that you don't have to receive him as Savior and that he's still going to love you, and that he won't cast you into hell, but everyone's going to heaven. I think of, how many of you know the old country star, Loretta Lynn? My parents had a record. It was a gospel record. And there was a song on there. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Lord, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to die. I really believe what she was trying to convey was this. We don't want to die to self. And how many of you know as being born again believers, that's a required thing on your resume. To die to self daily, Scripture says. <clears throat> the second thing that we see in Revelation 12 is that Satan also attacks the holy angels of God. Listen, I want to encourage you and let you know about something that you might not know about. 
How many of you know that there is an invisible war going around and on around us all the time? I believe that God is fighting on your behalf at all times. I believe that there's things in darkness and principalities that we necessarily don't see. How many know that sometimes you do see them? They rear their faces. They show themselves. But there's many times where it's just an invisible battle that is going on. I think about Gabriel. I think about Michael the archangel and what Scripture has to say about them. Most of the time, they're in battle, an intense battle. There's a battle raging. The third thing that Satan wants to attack and always attacks and always goes after is the nation of Israel. Listen, the nation of Israel is not out of the picture of God. Anybody that teaches that, that is not true doctrine. We have not replaced the children of Israel. How many realize that? Amen? Can I get some amens? God still has promises and plans that need to be fulfilled. And Satan, he hates the nation of Israel. You see God making promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. And the reason why Satan hates Israel so much is because it is the object of God's plan. And you see during the tribulation, they're going to be attacked in a way that is just unthinkable. The fourth thing that Satan attacks is us as believers. He attacks us. Many of you have experienced his attack. In fact, I just heard somebody say, oh yeah. Yeah, there it is again. Satan wants to attack you. He wants to do whatever he can to trip you up from doing God's will. Or following out God's plan in your life. And why is that? Why would you think that is? It's because we are the object of God's grace, love, and favor. And that just irritates Satan. You got to remember, Satan earned his position by what? Pride. Thinking that he was going to be equal to God. Pride. It says in verse 8 that it prowls, that this lion, this enemy prowls. And that word prowl there means to move about or wander stealth with, in a stealth way uh, in search of prey. And going back to the Colosseum, what Peter experienced this is was the, if they put out a group of eight or nine people, and sometimes children were involved in that, they would let the lions go And what the lions would do is they would prowl around this group. And they would wait for a whimper. They'd wait for a cry. They'd wait for one to move its position or leave the group so it could attack. This is what Peter's envisioning as he's reading this. And in the wild we know this. That there's an enemy... Or there's a, a lions in the wild, they prowl. How many of you have ever seen a video of lions prowling for prey? Lions usually do this. This is what they go after. Usually they go after the animal that is hurt, injured, after the small ones, or after the animals that have been separated. And see, Satan's this roaring lion. He's prowling. He's going to and fro. And I think of another story where we see that Satan was going to and fro the earth. In Job chapter 1, I believe it's in verse 6, we studied Job on Wednesday nights here just about eight months ago. It was a great study for myself. I just learned so much. But in that story, we know that there's a bet. That's what the Hebrews said, and that's the way that they convey it, that there was a bet between God and Satan. And Satan is going to and fro the earth. And God calls Satan and says, hey, come here. Come and talk with me. And they talk, and and he actually, God says this, have you considered my servant Job? So we see God actually point Job out to Satan. 
which a lot of people have a hard time with that. But that word consider in Job is actually a military term. It's what generals would use when they led an army. When they went to go take siege on the city, they would show up to the city and they would consider the city. They would look it over. They would actually sometimes send spies in to find out how strong their fortresses were. Any good army, any good general would do that, wouldn't they? So in that word consider... I want us to convey that and what Peter's saying here, that this line is prowling. How many does it make you uneasy to know that Satan is considering you? That he's looking at you, he's studying you. He. I remember being in the woods once, and I I believe it was a bobcat. And that bobcat was considering me. Even though I was much bigger, well, come to find out, now there's cougars in Michigan, which they denied for years, so maybe it was a cougar. But I remember walking out of the deer woods with my gun off safety backwards because this thing was growling at me the whole time. Just out of the darkness to where I couldn't see it. It was scary. Listen, Satan is studying each one of us. He's considering each one of us. And how many of you know that he knows your weak points? He knows your weak points. Again, he's an enemy that wants to bring destruction. He wants to steal whatever he can, whether that be joy, peace. He wants to rob you of it. And he knows exactly how to do it. He knows exactly where to get at you. Mm. He knows exactly what your weakness is because he has studied you. It says this in Job 1, 6-7. Let me read it. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to to and fro the earth and walking up and down it, prowling back and forth. Many of you know, I, I have a hard time sitting still behind a pulpit. I like to move. Very seldom. I, I mean, I, I've even recently when we pray you, you, up here before service, I, I've never been one that's really liked to sit, but I'll, I'll just move back and forth. And, and again, here's our enemy, who the Bible makes very clear. He prowls. He's stealthy. He's looking for someone to devour. And I would encourage you today to look at three different areas in your life. How many of you have ever seen the movie Ghost in the Darkness? Kirk Douglas. Great movie, true story. In 1898, there was a German builder that went to Africa to build a bridge over the River Savo. And he was given one year to complete the task, and it was a hard task. And so he got hired, and he went there, and he left his wife, who was pregnant with child, behind, in hopes to be home before Christmas, and he went in July. But a year went by. And the reason why a year went by is because there were two lions. In fact, you can go to a museum in Chicago, and those lions are the stuffed lions from this story I'm telling you. And what happened was this. Within days of him coming here to start this construction, these lions started to attack. And throughout a year, they killed, they figure, about 130 people. They had attack. And it wasn't just at night. Well, many attacks happened at night where they'd come in and they wouldn't just kill the person there, they would drag them off alive. And the story, what happens is this, is this bridge builder, he believes that he kills a lion. And they, right away, they, they throw him up on their shoulders. They're cheering for the great hunter. 
bridge builder and come to find out that days later he hadn't. Then he finds out not only is there one lion, but there's two lions that are working together. And they call them actually ghosts and darkness. Because when they had attacked it by day, they wouldn't see them. They would just come out of the blue. When they attacked at night, it was under the cover of darkness. Long story short, they hire a hunter named Remington. How many know who Remington, Remington Arms, Firearms? If you're a hunter, you know who Remington is. Or if you've got some oil in your house, you might know who Remington is. All right, I think they even make hair dryers and stuff now by Remington, right? It's kind of strange, but okay. They hire him, and long story short, Remington ends up dying. The lions attack him. And finally at the end, Patterson, the bridge builder, ends up killing these lions. But what they found out about these lions is this. That these lions, and I don't mean to gross anybody out here, they would not consume the flesh. What they would do is they would actually tear with their claws off the skin to drink the blood. All the bodies they found, that's how they were. And the reason for that is because those lions had bad teeth. They had teeth decay, and they had teeth that were gone, and, and, and they couldn't just attack like that. So they killed everything they killed with their claws and their paws. Listen, I want to share something with you. As born-again believers, the Bible says that Satan's under our feet. It says even this, that we invoke and speak the name of Jesus, that Satan must flee. I want to share with you some tactics today, because you know what? Satan to the born-again believer is like these lions from Savo. He cannot destroy you. You are safe in your Savior's hands. But he can cause chaos. He can cause fear. As I was studying a lion pride, usually what happens is this, is the oldest male lion, again, because of tooth issues, he doesn't hunt anymore. He sends out the young male lions and the lioness. In fact, lioness, ladies, are the ones that usually do most of the hunting. But what the lion with the bad teeth or the oldest lion that have lost teeth, what his job is is to, again, get his prime to circle undergrowth, thickets. And what he does is he stands back and he roars. And he roars on the end of the other end of the thicket. And what happens is it causes fear in any animal that's in that thicket and they run out to the pride. But he has no power to kill them. He has somebody else devouring them. He has someone else taking them down, doing the hard work. In the born-again believer's life, Satan is like that toothless lion. What he does is this. He Many a times he accuses us. I, I, I remember a song we used to sing. I hear the accuser roar of the ills that I have done, and I know them well in a thousand more. Jehovah findeth none. This opponent, uh, a me, another meaning of this opponent is one that slanders. Satan's name is slander, that idea of the slanderer, the one that slanders, the one that causes discourse, the one that wants to speak untruths into our life, the one that roars loud. I was at the zoo once with a youth group. This was uh, quite some time ago. In fact, it might have been with our kids group here when we were at Mountaintop Church. And I remember going to the zoo, and that day was the first time I ever heard a lion roar in real life. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but it was so loud, it resonated in my chest. Pastor Doug could come up here and beat these drums if the cover wasn't on there, and, and it could resonate in your chest. Or you could play a guitar, uh, certain chords, and it could resonate in your chest where you could feel it beating off your chest. And that lion that day at that zoo with the little kids there, he started roaring not only once, but he roared like eight times. It was just amazing. 
but I remember it resonating off of my chest and just the power of it to the point that I blocked my ears. It was that loud. And you guys know the, the, the wall that keeps you separated or the moat is quite some ways away because they understand lions can do destruction. But Satan is like that roaring lion in our lives. In John 10.10, 10, like I've referred to earlier, the thief comes only, only to steal and kill and destroy. That is his reasoning for coming to us. That's the only thing that he wants to do is to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus said this, and I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. You've heard me talk about this abundant life here many times. I will never preach it in the prosperity gospel way because that is from the devil. That is from hell. The prosperity gospel that is taught not only in this country but is being exported out of this country is a lie. I know pastors overseas that are saying, please do not send us any missionaries that believe in this prosperity gospel because it's destroying our churches over here. But what that means to live an abundant life is this, is in his will, doing his plan, is having peace to rest your head at night on your pillow and go to sleep. Not a worry in the world. Not a care. Because we serve a God that says you can cast your cares on him. That is the abundant life. I've never felt fuller than when I'm in the will of God and walking it out. Can I hear an amen? Amen. I love hearing amen. I was at that conference recently and a, and a, a, a brother actually said this, a, a black brother that spoke at the conference actually said this, in the white American church, I've had to learn that when people don't say nothing and they just look at you, that they're intently listening. But when I go to my church, I want amen. I want to know people are hearing and listening and that they're getting it. So amen. So what does Satan want to do in our lives as believers? The main thing he wants to do is make you ineffective for God's kingdom. There's many ways that he can do this. He can do this by the new boat that you bought, that you invest all your money and time in. He could do it by a vacation property that you own, a deer hunting lease. He could do it by having ice on the water for the next three months. He, he does it in many different ways. He can even use our children. I see a lot of people today that claim that their children, that worship their children more than they worship their God. They let their kids make decisions on what they're going to do. And instead of asking God and following God's words, they allow the kids or the prisoners to run the jail. Sports can be a God. He, he can get your influence in your mind off of things through watching sports 24-7 a day. Uh, why do you think there's a sports network that runs daily all the time? To get our attention. He can get your attention by you feeling alone. That nobody cares for me. He'll get you by Again, getting you frustrated and causing you to hold bitterness and anger. He gets you by not fellowshipping with others. He'll get you by not going to church and being with your brothers and sisters in Christ. He'll get you by causing you to focus on just yourself. And what happens in all those things is this, is we stop watching for the enemy. We stop being sober. We stop being watchful. We get our eyes on other things that draw our attention. We hear his roar, and it scares us at times. It invokes fear in us. We hear his accusations towards us. How many have ever heard this? Oh, God didn't hear your prayer. He's not going to answer your prayer. 
How many have ever heard this? Oh, God's not going to fulfill his promise to you. Who are you to call yourself a Christian? Boy, when we mess up, how many have ever had that come against you? Ah, you're not good enough. Who made us good enough? Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible says this, that he made us righteous before the Father through his blood on the cross. He attacks us by lies. It says in John 8, that he is the father of lies. And he attempts to deceive us by twisting everything and completely changing God's word with the only purpose to confuse us. I, I've seen an attack on God's word like I've never seen it before in the day that we're living. Listen, don't buy into it. God's word is living, it's alive, it's inspired. It gives us everything we need to get through life, Scripture says. Another way that Satan attacks us is through temptation. Anybody here ever been tempted? See, the thing is, is this, that Satan cannot inhabit a believer. I'm going to share something with you. Uh, A Christian, born-again Christian, cannot be demon-possessed. And I've seen demon possession. I could tell you stories that would be better than most of the scary movies you watch. It's real. But the thing is, is this, is that again, the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You can bank on that. But since the devil can't enter you, demon cause a demon to fill you, what he'll do is this, is he'll tempt you. He'll speak to you. He'll know because he's considered you. He has studied you what your weak points are. And he'll go after those. Whether it be alcohol, pornography, uh, anything that's in your life, he knows the weakness in your life. And he's going to go after it time and time again. And I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, instead of going towards those things that our flesh wants to go to, go towards God. Again, Jesus is enough. The third way that he schemes against us, he manipulates us. Manipulation. Why Satan is not all-powerful, he is very clever and skillful. And he manipulates situations and people always to achieve his purpose of provoking us to sin. Listen, I'm going to share something with you today that might be hard. The enemy does this a lot in believers' lives through unforgiveness. You know that the Bible makes it clear that, again, I don't think it's a matter of salvation. In fact, I know it's not a matter of salvation. We've studied this out And it says that if you cannot forgive another, that your father will not forgive you. Unforgiveness stops your intimacy with the Lord. It breaks it. If you're here today and you're harboring unforgiveness, listen, devil's using that to manipulate you. And more than likely, the person that was used or you holding this unforgiveness towards was also manipulated by Satan to cause you to stumble, to cause you to be ineffective in your walk for Him. The Bible makes it clear that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers that we can't even see. We prayed for Debbie, and Sue could, she said, Amen. And I can tell you this too, as being someone that has served the church, church people aren't always nice. I've had people tell me that they downright hate me. Wanna and I and I've said to somebody once before, so you want to murder me? Because if you got hate in your heart, Jesus says you want to murder, then that's murder, and 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 boy, that opened up a conversation. But the thing is, is this is don't allow yourself to be manipulated. 
The enemy knows your weakness. You know your weakness. Run from it to God. Run from it. Run to Christ. So how do we battle Satan? In James 4, 7, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn there. James 4, 7. It would be a good verse for you to mark or circle in your Bible. To put up on your mirror in your bathroom or on your refrigerator or on your steering wheel. It says this. This is how we defeat him. One of the ways. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. In temptation... Jesus, when he started his ministry, went into the wilderness. Satan started tempting him. And what did Jesus use to battle it? Scripture, the Word of God. He, in fact, he invoked the Word of God throughout that whole temptation process. And what did the devil do? He misused the Word of God, he distorted it. See, our enemy is clever. In many ways, what he does almost in every area is this, is he will counterfeit what God does. I'm going to tell you something. I came from a very heavy, heavy Pentecostal background. I love Pentecost. I love what happened in Acts. I love the renewal of us. I love when when I feel a new or freshening it happens in revival in my own life. I love it. But I'll tell you something. I experienced some things that I know now were not God, but the enemy. In walls, in buildings that had names on it that said that they were church. You know how I know it? It's because I can go back in Scripture and it's not there. Never will you find in Scripture where we're supposed to cluck like chickens. Never in Scripture will you find where we're supposed to bark like dogs or run around like you're on fire or slither through the aisles like we are snakes. See, Not everything we see that is supernatural or we think is supernatural is of God. And I always go back to Moses in this instance. See, remember when Moses came to Pharaoh? He was on the behalf of the children of Israel. And what happened there was this, is that Moses, the magicians, turned their rods into snakes, their staffs into snakes. And Moses turned his staff into snakes. And what happened? His staff swallowed their snakes up. They had a power to change a stick into a snake. Listen, there is darkness and there is power and everything that you see that is supernatural is not of God. We still serve a supernatural God. I still preach that God can heal any one of us here. But it's His sovereign will if He does. I've been healed by God. I can never say that he does not heal. But a lot of things we see today, if it does not line up with the word of God, it's not God. So we submit ourselves to God. How many know, boy, that's tough. Constant surrender, constant surrender, constant surrender. Resist the devil. Listen, Jesus resisted temptation by using Scripture. This is why we need to be in the Word. This is why we need to hide the Word of God in our hearts. How many have ever been in the place where Satan comes and attacks and you go, let me see, what did that Scripture say? Uh, uh, Let me see. Uh, 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 Devil, just have your way. I don't even have my Bible with me. No, we need to hide key verses in our heart. If if you can't memorize them, write them down someplace where you can go and use the Word of God for battle. Another way we fight the Word of God is simply, or fight Satan, is to put on the battle gear that he's given us. 
In, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, it says this, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle with against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual foes of, uh, forces of evil and in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand it in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. If we put on the whole armor of God, we will be able to endure the rage of Satan until the time of his doom or in the time we leave this world. Satan has been defeated in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the reason why he is under the believer's feet. In Hebrews 2.14, it says this, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing, that through the death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to a lifelong slavery. Because we are partakers of what, what Christ has done. Listen, you don't have to fear the enemy. You have to be watchful though. You have to understand the enemy is prowling. He's always trying to get at you. How is Satan being defeated now? Through us. As we believe and speak the word of God, as we put on the whole armor of God, as we share the gospel. My last point is finally, someday... He will be vanquished. He will be thrown into the lake of fire to never to be able to deceive or torment anybody in this world again. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.25, Christ must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Christ did that when he resurrected from the grave. And he died on the cross. In Ephesians 1.22 it says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. That is saying that things are already under Christ's feet. In Romans 16.20 it says this, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's a glorious problem. Our promise there to us who are saints of God. It seems so many times that Satan has the upper hand. It seems so many times that Satan's devouring the world that we're living in. I'm telling you, church, don't give up. I think about, again, the people that he's talking to here, the persecuted church. How many know that in the last century there's been more people killed for the cause of Christ than any time between 100 years back to Christ? It's amazing. More people have died in the past 100 years for Jesus Christ. Incredible. So I'm going to ask you today to stand with me. I would love to take another two or three times. In fact, I need to do a study on this maybe on a Wednesday night. But I want you to stand with me this morning. I'm going to ask uh, Michelle if she would come. I'm going to ask some of our prayer partners to go off to the side over here. Maybe today as I was speaking, you've realized that you have allowed Satan to do destruction in your life. Maybe you've realized that you've had openings in your life uh, through disobedience, through acting on sin, the lust of the flesh. And today, the Holy Spirit's opened your eyes and you say, man, I'm going to be sober-minded. I'm going to be watchful. I understand today that there's a real enemy and he has had his way in my life. A good way to ask yourself 
if the enemy has had his way in your life, because sometimes it's so subtle, we don't recognize it, is this. When was the last time you shared Jesus Christ? When was the last time you shared the good news, the gospel? When was the last time that you put somebody above yourself? That you preferred them because of the love of Christ? When was the last time that you laid down your life for someone else? When was the last time you served someone? These are all indicators. If Satan has made you ineffective, what are you doing for him? Everything I see in the, in the Gospels, in the New Testament, points toward, towards us sharing the good news. Going forth. Has Satan made you ineffective? We can do this in so many ways. Glorifying God in everything we do. And declaring it. Sometimes the Lord, by the prompt of the Holy Spirit, will have you come directly and again pray for someone, speak to someone. Uh, when was the last time that you spoke the truth in love to someone? That's not easy. Maybe you're recognizing now that you've been ineffective. And listen, it's been the enemy, he's been attacking you. Satan's okay with churches that are ineffective for him that just come every Sunday. That, that come here, again, I often say this, that we just can't come here and just be takers or hearers. We have to be doers. The scripture says, don't deceive yourself. And again, those doing things, it only comes out of our love because again, our salvation is not by works, but works are birthed from our salvation, our love for him. We keep the commands of Christ because he loves us and we love him. I don't cheat on my wife because I'm worried about what everybody here would think of me. I don't cheat on my wife because I love her. It's a big difference. So this morning, if you have found yourself ineffective, I would encourage you to to go see one of our prayer partners. Let them pray with you. Come and see me after service. I'll pray with you because you know what? We're all in this together. Don't separate yourself from one another. Don't be wounded. Listen, if you're wounded here today, uh, verse 7 that I'm going to end with here is this. This is to cast all your cares on him. That word cast there means to, it's the idea of taking off a blanket off of a donkey of a horse and casting it aside. The reason for that blanket on that horse's back is because it was going to have to carry a load, some weight. And God says this, cast it off today. Don't carry it anymore. You don't have to carry the weight. I'll carry it for you. So maybe today you've realized, don't be deceived. Satan will have you right where he wants you. Don't be deceived in where your marriage is, where your effectiveness is in, in your job, where, uh, where your neighborhood. Uh, don't, don't be deceived. Why do we try to look so different or look, look like the world when we've been created different? We look different than them. So I'm going to pray this morning. Don't allow the enemy to have a foothold. Today, I'm going to invoke the name of Jesus, not as some magic spell, magic spell or, or just a word, but I'm going to pray the name of Jesus that many here are free today. Because my King, my Lord Jesus Christ, can heal anybody. He can repair any brokenness that is here this morning. So Father, we just come before you today. Lord, as Peter was delivering this word to those that are persecuted, he's saying, listen, even in this suffering, in this temptation, there's, a, there's this suffering and, and there's this temptation to do that, what's not right. 
when things get hard, we, 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 don't, we don't always do the right thing. And Peter's warning these people, listen, you're being persecuted. There's been hard things that have come against you. And he actually makes it clear in verse 9 that it's not just us alone, but there's a brotherhood of people that are suffering. And that is the church. That is the brother, brothers and sisters in Christ. So this morning, Lord, cause us, Lord, not to be feeling like we're alone, that we're the only ones. God, I confess to you, Lord, that there's areas in my life where the enemy, he has looked. He knows my weakness. God, I'm going to choose to submit to you. I'm going to choose to resist the devil. I'm going to run. I'm going to turn to you. I'm going to use the word of God. I'm going to use the weapons, Lord, that you've given me. Father, I pray today, Lord, if there's anybody here that has found themselves ineffective, Lord, that today is their day to proclaim no more, Satan. And in the name of Jesus, they will be set free today from any strongholds, any chains that are bound them and have kept them bound. If it's an area of unforgiveness, God, I cause it. Lord, I ask, Lord, that you just, Lord, speak to their hearts right now and, and let them free, set them free in the name of Jesus. Satan, today you must flee because of the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, I just thank you today. Cause us, Lord, to be those that are submitted. Cause us, Lord, Lord, to be those that resist. Cause us, Lord, to put on the whole armor of God. Cause us, Lord, to use your word daily in battle against the enemy so we don't believe his lies. Father, we just thank you. We just praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless you. If you need prayer, please don't leave here without getting it. We will see you Wednesday night.